Welcome to the Growing Pulses in 2020 webinar on Pulse Markets in Victoria, NSA. My name is Claire and I work with BCG uh, and I coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability opportunities. The purpose of today's webinar is to give new and existing pulse growers a current market update across Victoria and South Australia. Now, before we start the webinar, everybody should be muted. We will take questions after the presentation and the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen allows you to ask questions. So if you see a button for Q&A, if you click that, you can open the window. Type your question into the box and hit send. You can also check send anonymously if you don't want your name attached to your question. This webinar is also being recorded. So if you can't stay for the whole thing, or if you have technical issues, or you would like to share this at a later stage, the recordings will be made available on the GRDC YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Now let's get straight into today's presentation. I'd like to introduce you all to Francois Darkus from AgriOz Exports. He began this company in 2013. He is based in Horsham. Francois grew up in France and has worked in many countries around the world. His main focus is on pulse exports and including faba beans into Egypt. So I'll now hand over to you, Francois. Thank you, Claire. Uh, I am based in Melbourne, not Horsham. <laughs> Otherwise, everything okay. Um, so Sorry about that. That's okay. Good morning, all. So I will kick off with, uh, so as Claire mentioned, uh, Agrios Export is, is focusing mostly on purses exports, and I would say mostly out of Victoria and South Australia, uh, but also from other states, uh, Queensland, New South Wales, and WA. Uh, I will start with uh, paper beans. This first slide uh, shows you the Australian exports in thousands of tons from 2013 until uh, this year. Um, so for 2019-20, uh, it's a year-to-date number uh, covering October to January. So this slide's uh, purpose is to show really that the fiber beans market, the export market for Australian fiber beans is very heavily uh, centered on the Middle East. So you can see that Egypt regularly takes uh, 65 to 70 percent of our exports. You add Saudi Arabia and the uh, United Arab Emirates and you get to 80, 85 percent on average. So this is a traditional food in the Middle East and that is clearly shown in our export numbers, which also uh, <coughs> makes, makes it a uh, a market that's not well balanced in terms of risk. Uh, it would be good if a certain company could find other benefits, uh, and we will come to that in another slide. You can see also the <coughs> export volumes can fluctuate quite a bit. Uh, quite a bit. Look at the, the numbers for 2016-17, and you see massive export of 461,000 tons just to the two markets. Uh, 16, 17, obviously. So Australia produced record crops of everything. Uh, it was a very, very good growing season. And in that year, not only did we export big volumes, uh, the feed market in Australia had to come to the rescue because really uh, there was only so much we could export, and it, even at very low prices, uh, this we reached the, the limit of the, the export demand, and, and I, ex I estimate. Domestic feed markets probably that year consumed around 100,000 tons, which is unusual. Next slide. Uh, the other destinations, other than the Middle East, uh, so we have a collection of several smaller markets. Indonesia is a fairly regular market with 10 to 12,000 tons 
per year, uh, but those are mostly the, the large broad beans, which are trading at a generally a large premium to flavor beans. So it's a bit of a niche market within the, the flavor beans market. India, interestingly, in 1617, when we had the big crop and very low prices, India stepped in and, and bought about 22,000 tons. Um, but you can see also that they went back to zero in 1819 last year when our prices uh, shot up um, uh, in dramatic fashion. So India is a huge producer, consumer, and importer of purses. And basically, if something is cheap enough, they will try it. and. Uh, substituted with some of their own purses or some of their imported purses. In that case, in 1617, India was importing some feather beans on the, on the East Coast in Calcutta for splitting and uh, on the West Coast in Mumbai for uh, flour milling. And they were blending the flour with pea flour. So that's something we could see happen again if our prices went back to lower levels, and I'm talking here in, uh, around that sort of $300 port. Um, we even saw lower prices in 1617. I think it went as low as $250. Uh, Vietnam is a slowly growing market. The imports are mainly for uh, fish food, for fish farming. Uh, very price sensitive also. It, it will pop up when prices are low. It will decrease drastically when prices are high. Now, the big potential is China. Um, China in the 80s and 90s was the largest, may still be the largest producer of paper beans, broad beans in the world, uh, but at the time was also the largest exporter. Now it is consuming all of its production and would probably import uh, if uh, they could. So the problem we have here is there's no market issue for paper beans. There's no existing phytosanitary protocol between uh, Australia and China. The GMF, which stands for Grain Industry Market Access Forum, is working on it, but uh, it seems that it, it is not a priority at all for the Chinese government. And as you all know, probably there are a number of uh, political tensions with China also, so other issues like Bali and so on. So it may not be resolved very soon, but it would be fantastic for the Australian feather bean growers to have that additional large market because then we would not depend so much on that Middle Eastern demand, which can be quite volatile. Um, an emerging market, in this case, it's domestic, but there might be export also working into that new industry, which is a, that uh, protein extraction. So you've all heard about veggie burgers and protein powders and so on. Uh, Veggie, um, veggie pasta also and so on. So there's a plant uh, being built in Horsham that should come online fairly soon, I think. I, I forget what will be their uh, offtake initially. It's not huge, but it's interesting because it could be growing in future or it could be the first of uh, many uh, if that market for vegetable protein uh, expands. I'll move on to the next slide. So this slide gives uh, you an idea of uh, what Australia competes against in, uh, in that favor in this market. Uh, so I have some data here stretching back to 01 or 02. Uh, Australia appears in, uh, in sort of purple. You have France in yellow, the UK in light blue, and uh, the Baltic, which is mainly Lithuania, but also a little bit of Poland, um, Latvia, and I think I've heard of uh, Germany also uh, more recently, so in dark blue. So you can see in 01 or 02, uh, Australia had the whole Egyptian market almost for itself. Um, and then we had that drought, 02 or 03, uh, where uh, there was practically nothing to export from here. And that sort of opened the door of the Egyptian market to France and the UK, which had traditionally been growing feather beans, but mostly for animal feed. So that year, the Egyptians had no alternative. They had to start importing from those countries. And those countries realized that if they tweaked the quality a little bit, there was a good market there that would pay better money than a food market. So you can see after that, uh, Australia continued to, well, see a decreasing market share. and that's because in the 2000, we had several years of 
pretty poor crop, especially 06 or 07 or 07 or 08, which allowed uh, the French and, uh, and the UK uh, producers to gain market share in Egypt. It's only when you cross 2010 that we get back to sort of more regular crops here in Australia that we we end up at a pretty much, uh, it's a three-tiered market with, with uh, the UK, France, and Australia sharing that market in about a third each. Uh, more recently, you see in 15, 16, 16, 17, uh, the French market share drops to almost nothing. And that is due to the introduction of uh, some bans on some insecticides. Uh, I think it has to do with uh, insecticide that are deemed to uh, pretty much kill off the, the bee population. So some insecticide have become forbidden and French growers are not able to produce that good human food quality. Basically they have paper beans that are uh, very heavily insect damaged. Uh, so their paper beans pretty much go on into feed markets and as a result of lower prices, the French paper bean production has really decreased. I don't think there's much left of it. The UK production has also decreased a bit, uh, in part also quality issues. They have a lot of uh, problems controlling the insect populations. And also I think there has been uh, a growing feed demand in Europe, Northern Europe especially for fish farming, salmon farming in, in, uh, in Scotland and so on. So a lot of UK fiber beans going to feed markets. But markets have a, a way of uh, resolving problems very quickly. You can see that as the French exports dropped and disappeared, uh, we saw a new competitor emerge and that's what is called the Baltic, which is mostly Lithuania. We will produce a pretty good quality comparable to Australian. And uh, for the last four or five years, I've had a pretty steady production and uh, managed to export 150 to 200,000 tons to Egypt. Uh, so we've again become sort of a, a treated market, the Baltic, the UK and Australia, uh, with the Australian shares fluctuating depending on our crop size. There are other smaller producers. Canada has been trying to develop a, a fiber bean uh, crop for a number of years. They are still not producing large numbers and the quality also is still a problem. We're starting to see also a little bit of a fiber bean production in the Black Sea in uh, Ukraine and so on, still minimal, but uh, it could be, it could become a more significant competition. Okay, next slide. Uh, a bit of a historical view at the, the pricing of Australian fabulin since 2016. You can see a uh, pretty strong uh, volatility year on year, uh, lows of say 300. So DCT stands for delivered container terminal. So it's basically the product brought to the port, packed into a container and delivered to the port. So 16, 17, so shortly after harvest, February 17, April 17, we see the trading at very low levels of 300. At those levels, the Victorian feed industry was consuming a fair amount of fiber beans and it subsidies uh, fees for fiber beans um, in their rations. Then, um, if you move on to last year, um, so the 2018-19 the crop, you can see a sharp acceleration in, in price increases from October 18 until February April 19. Uh, so what we had last year was not only a smaller crop in Australia um, with a pretty dry finish in both Victoria and SA, but uh, there was also a decrease in production last year in the UK and in the Baltics of the Egyptian market was pretty much short of product and that explains this sharp rise in price but you can also see the, the sharp drop from June to August 19 so basically there's probably a little bit of a speculative frenzy in the market both in Egypt and here in Australia and some unfortunate traders got caught with very high price product and uh, pretty much the market didn't trade at all from that sort of 1200 to say 700 so there was a very sharp drop in credit campaign for some companies and some importers. Then uh, prices stabilized a bit and then we've seen them uh, increase again during harvest this year. Uh, they have stabilized a little bit since or even weakened. Uh, I was surprised by that. I would have thought this year's crop was 
quite larger than last year, and it may still be, but uh, there's probably uh, an issue of growth not selling as much as uh, the trade would have expected, and that's explained that rise in the 800 level where we are. We're not there anymore. I would say today the, the market price, GCT, Jolly Company, Terminal, Melbourne, Adelaide is in the low 700s. Uh, going forward, I wouldn't venture any forecast for next year's prices. Uh, it depends obviously on how much we grow here in Australia, but also what other countries grow. And, and, and the financial stability in countries like Egypt also is a really big factor. Uh, so no forecast for next year. Next slide. So just a quick uh, look at what it looks like uh, once it's uh, processed into a traditional Middle Eastern dish. So full medemis, it, it basically the beans are soaked and cooked into a um, spicy and uh, tomato sauce. And that's typically breakfast food, very filling. You don't need a lot to feel full and uh, to be fed for the day. And then something maybe more familiar uh, here in Australia is falafel. So it's, uh, I guess it, you could call it the precursor of the, the veggie burger. It's uh, the faba beans are split and broken in small bits, and then it makes a very sort of coarse flour with which you make those falafel that are then eaten in some sort of sandwich and, and flatbread. Um, moving on to field peas. <coughs> So in that first slide, I'm showing also the various export destinations. And you can see uh, a very interesting, disappointing evolution uh, if you look in the, the role with India. Uh, so India for many years was the main market for Australian uh, field peas exports. In, in, you know, in the early, in the mid 2000s and early 2010s, uh, two, three bulk shipments would go every year to India, in addition to our containers. Um, here again, we see what we saw for fiber beans and what we will see later for lentils, a sharp increase in exports in 16, 17. Same story, big crops, uh, low prices, uh, plenty of export availability. But since then, you can see exports to India are pretty much grinding to a halt and then my forecast it will be zero or not much more in 1920. Uh, the reason being that India in 1718 started in introducing import duties, which in the case of peas became a total import ban or zero import quota, um, which is not a good development for the, the Australian peas uh, growers, but that's what we have to live with. Uh, that's reality today. <coughs> um, so in terms of what other markets, Bangladesh is a pretty steady market, around 20,000 tons a year. Um, Malaysia has actually been decreasing and I think I would say it's generally speaking, Australian peas have become expensive or more expensive in relation to Canadian yellow peas or even black sea yellow peas. Um, so countries that are price sensitive, such as Malaysia, uh, are importing less. Pakistan is not a regular market for uh, Australian peas. You can see a spike at 9,000 uh, in 1617. Again, that year we were quite cheap. Sri Lanka is a regular but small market, but they import more peas in split form. So that is not part of that table. Uh, but so Sri Lanka is a fair amount of split peas from Australia. China was uh, giving the industry some hope um, in 16, 17, but it could just have been the same thing that we had a lot of cheap peas and the Chinese um, basically got started importing Australian peas, but as our prices went back up in 1819 and this year, their import levels are very minimal. In China, they import our peas mainly for um, bird seed. Uh, we cannot compete on price with the Canadian peas, uh, the Canadian export over a million tons to China, but that's mostly um, for industries such as protein extraction or um, starch extraction. In the other category, you have a number of smaller destinations, but so basically you can see that our exports have come down to not much, 66,000 tons last year. I forecast it won't be much more than 50,000 tons this year. 
looks like the Australian PEs in 1920 PE squad was fairly small and then with still fairly strong demand and uh, until now for feed uh, feed items um, we are pretty much out priced in the export market. So that chart is basically the previous chart, the previous uh, slide, uh, just in, in chart form. Um, you can see India in dark blue um, coming down to almost nothing after hitting almost 140,000 tons of seeds in 17. And then all the other markets really uh, relatively stable, but all pretty small. Uh, so same story here, our exports, uh, not much anymore. To put things in perspective, that slide shows uh, productions of the main peas exported or producers. So you can see that our crop sizes are not even 10% of the Canadian crop, which hovers between 3.5 and 4 million tons. Um, the US also produces a lot more peas than, than Australia. France, although most of those peas are consumed uh, in the domestic feed industry. Russia has become a big factor. Same thing, a lot of their peas are actually exported to Western Europe to feed, but they have also taken market share in the Indian subcontinent in recent years. Same with the Ukraine. And then Indian subcontinent, so that would be mostly India. So India has a peas crop. It's not a huge crop compared to the chickpea crop, which can reach 16, 17, 18 million tons. But uh, it is a pretty few nonetheless. So you can see that really we are a uh, second rate player in the peas market in Australia. We, we really don't grow that much. And, and when we were exporting, exporting to India, it was going into niche markets in India, um, not so much competing head on with the Canadian European. Most Australian peas exports were going to South East India, where the peas are consumed more as a snack food, where they are split and roasted and consumed as a snack. So that slide also is designed to uh, give some perspective on uh, Australia's uh, size in the world market. You can see the, the Canadian exports. Uh, you can see that. They are now, China is now the largest destination market, although it has come down to from what it was in 1718 and 1819. Uh, again, those peas go mostly into extraction industries, uh, protein and starch. <coughs> Bangladesh, fairly large market, but quite irregular with some spikes, some years, and some years more quiet. Very difficult to understand why. And, explain those fluctuations. India, so same uh, sort of chart as for Australia, you can see India in 1670 importing almost 2 million tons from Canada and uh, this coming year it's going to end up very close to zero because of that zero quota. Then you have some smaller markets. Um, but so basically, um, yeah, that slide again shows the Australian pea industry is really a niche industry compared to some of our competitors. And uh, we, we can only hope to sell into some premium market that really want or prefer our type of pea, but the volumes are already limited. So the outlook for peas, uh, I would say that the market is in transition. And you've seen that in the previous slides with India pretty much stopping imports. And I'll explain a little bit why India is doing that. Um, but with India shutting imports, can we see the, the protein extraction industry replace that demand? I mean, obviously, it's, it's all over the news. It's uh, very much talked about you know, the veggie burger and all the sort of uh, pulses pasta and all the protein supplement or protein flowers and so on. It is difficult to quantify the demand. The industry is growing fast. Uh, is it growing fast? Uh, to respond real demand, or is there going to be a bit of a speculative bubble and, and overinvestment, and then some of these new plants will shut down? I, I wouldn't have an answer on that, but I would say the timing is good because as we are losing India as a destination market, then that 
petroleum extraction industry. Hopefully, you can pick up the slack. Um, and it is big in Canada, in Europe, and in China. Um, we, there's not much scope in Australia for doing that because first our purchase crops are not as large and then uh, in terms of market a lot of that putting powder or putting products would have to be exported so we may not have a comparative advantage in that field um, although there is a, a, a plant in construction in Horsham as I said in the, in the Faber Beans uh, presentation um, that will start um, making um, putting or extracting putting from Faber Beans It'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Um, all that means to say that Australian peas have become pretty much a domestic crop, uh, or at least as much as an export crop, uh, especially in dry years like we've had the last few years, with very strong domestic feed demand, our peas tend to outprice themselves from the, the world market. Um, now, why has English shot uh, access to the market for peas. The main, uh, the fundamental goal from the Indian government is to raise local prices for farmers to achieve self-sufficiency. So basically to create price incentive for growers and by protecting the market from cheap imports. The main or the largest prices crop grown in India is not peas but chickpeas. But in the last 15 years, the Canadian uh, peas industry has really created a, a new sub-market in India where yellow peas come from Canada are very cheap and are substituted for local chickpeas in the form of flour or in the form of sweet peas. So by shutting uh, down the access to peas, the Indian government is essentially protecting the chickpea farmer in India. And, and what we've seen, well, normally when, when the market was wide open, uh, imported yellow peas would trade at a big discount to local chickpeas. Newer product, not as liked, and so on. But what we're seeing now in India is pretty interesting with uh, very few peas in the market. Whatever peas do manage to find a way in because there are some holes in the, in the wall, a bit of corruption here and there. Uh, we are seeing imported Canadian peas trading at a premium to local chickpeas, which creates an incentive for people to try to uh, get around the rules and, and do get some peas into the market. So we'll, uh, we'll end up continue that policy. Uh, I would say they've been fairly lucky or successful. They've had two good, three good years of uh, purchase crops. So there's no sign uh, that they need to stop that. They would need to stop that if they, if they had a bad year, really, uh, the purchase crop was really insufficient and they would have to reopen the market. But there's no sign of that at the moment. They are just harvesting their winter crops called the rabbit crop and they look pretty good, pretty big, possibly record crops. So uh, we'll have at least another year of uh, no access to India. Um, Francois, we've just had a question come in. Would you be happy to take that now? Sure. Okay. Um, with China being such a large producer, what is the typical sort of end use of fibre beans in that country? In China? In China, yes. There, there are several. Uh, food, you do see uh, fibre beans in, 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 in some dishes and as snacks also, roasted. And also I believe a fair amount of the local production is uh, also used in uh, starch extraction. Uh, there's a huge uh, vermicelli noodle industry in China and uh, part of the starch to manufacture those vermicelli noodles come from peas or fever beans. So there's both a food demand and an industrial demand. Okay, thank you, Francois. Um, we've got about a minute left. Yeah, okay, I'll uh, quickly go to prices. So you can see Pea prices are actually less volatile than favors. We haven't seen the lentils, but we have seen movements. Uh, and that's probably because we cannot go too low. There is always feed demand to support the market. We cannot go too high. Quick photos of uh, Australian peas being uh, processed in India. So they are roasted. You can see that uh, oven there, the peas transit through that oven for a very short period of time, and then they are split and packaged. 
and they are marketed down in different markets. It's pretty tasty actually. Uh, there's a little bit of a spicy coating also on, on the peas. Moving on to lentils, um, exports from Australia in the last uh, six years. Pretty much same story as the other products we just saw. A huge spike in exports in 16, 17, when our crop was probably about a million tons. Um, then we had another good crop in 17, 18, plus a large carryover from the year before, so we still have big exports. But it looks like we're going back to more average type crops and export programs in the last two years. Uh, which is say between three and four hundred thousand tons. Uh, we've seen smaller years than that in the 2000s, but that, that seems to be the average uh, program for Australia. Main markets, Bangladesh has really established itself as the main, more regular market, and that is because they have a preference for the lentils we mostly grow here, the smaller types, the nipper, hurricane types, which is very fortunate for the Australian industry, or maybe it's not luck, but it's good research by the, the breeders who've uh, produced a lentil that's vastly preferred by Bangladesh to the point that they will often pay a large premium over Canadian lentil to buy the Australian. India has remained relatively open for lentils. They have only a 30%, 33% uh, import duty, which uh, still allows the product to get in. Otherwise, our other regular markets are Sri Lanka and the UAE. Uh, lentils export destination, so same slide as before, the, the main markets, you can see all the total tracking in 16, 17. Main market constituting uh, is Bangladesh in blue. India is still there, but that's really a price market. We have to be competitive with Canada to get there, and we're not always. And Sri Lanka in light blue, and then a collection of smaller markets. Egypt does buy our uh, type lentils, but never in large. So a bit of perspective, our crop compared to uh, other crops, uh, similar to peas, our lentils crops may be on average, uh, you know, not much more than 10 to 20% of the Canadian crop. The US also have big crops. India has their own crop, but they are still net importers. Turkey has faded in the last few years. There used to be a bigger producer, but uh, produced a lot less. So we are, because of our size, we are again, uh, Bit of a price follower, the price is made really by the Canadian crop. Canadian exports, also from perspective, um, you can see that uh, in, exports to India also are dwindling down to not much, um, but always on a much larger scale than ours. Uh, Bangladesh is a different story. We export more to Bangladesh than Canadians do, and that's because of the preference for our nickel type. Lentils pricing, so you can see very uh, wide variations, just like uh, for fiber beans. So, and, and that's a very interesting chart because we had huge prices in, in 15, 16. India had a couple of bad years, was importing massively. Huge prices then produced our massive crop in 16, 17. Prices came down. And as prices came down, our crops have started to really shrink again and prices are going up again. This being said, uh, the lentils market is fairly balanced, I would say. Uh, it looks like we can grow consistently crops 300 to 500,000 tons and market them without too much problem. But that always depends, of course, on uh, the crop size in Canada. And the good news in lentils is that we only pay a 33% import tariff in India, so the market is not entirely shut. Um, I think that's it. Francois, do you mind if we open it up to some questions now? Yeah, no problem. Um, so if anyone has a question, please click the Q&A button down the bottom of your screen and you can type the question in there. So far, we've just had the one question come in. Um, Francois, I've got a question for you. It might be a little bit too early to tell, but with the impact of coronavirus around the world, 
what impact do you think that may have on uh, pulse markets in the latter part of this year? Okay, um, I, I'll qualify my answer. So nobody really knows how it's gonna pan out, but you can look at it from two angles. Uh, first angle, the optimistic one, pulses are food people need to eat. Um, so that's gonna continue. But in the short term, short to medium term, I mean, it could be more than just short term, it could be several months, uh, we will see probably some disruption. Uh, we are already seeing a bit of disruption in the supply chain in the sense that to export in containers, we need containers to come from China with white goods and whatever uh, we import from China. There's been a, a stop of, you know, call it six weeks. So we're going to see that um, in the form of a shortage of containers here with shipping lines to export. So that can create some delays. Um, and, you know, basically some shipments scheduled for March or April that may have to wait a bit longer. Um, then I'm starting to see with some of our customer uh, some worries where uh, they're saying, well, there are some containers piling up in the port because of coronavirus. You know, maybe less people come to work or some countries are starting to put uh, border border bans or border blocks. So will that apply to merchandise? So we could get into a situation at the extreme where our containers arrive destination countries and pretty much nobody is there to receive them because everybody's quarantined or, or the country has put a total ban on movement of people and goods, hopefully not. But so we could see some disruption of that receiving and uh, in export markets where uh, more businesses just suddenly uh, or importers are not able to handle their imports uh, from a logistical point of view and hopefully not from a financial point of view. Some businesses uh, start falling over and uh, or just refuse to pay because they're not able to handle the goods uh, from a logistical point of view. So yeah, we have to be careful. Uh, there might be, I think there will be some disruption, but Hopefully this is normal in a couple of months and uh, life goes on, but uh, we'll learn more as we go. Okay, Francois, we've got another question that's just come in. Um, are people around the world stocking up on dry pulses as they are safe and easy to store while you are isolated at home or not a big change to demand? Uh, too early to say, but if you see the behavior of the Australian consumer here, uh, yeah, that could happen. I mean, people here seem to be stocking up on all sort of things, but mainly if you go to the supermarket, you'll find uh, not much rice, not much pasta left. Uh, so people are stocking up on products you can store safely. Um, so pulses could be one, and especially in countries that consume a lot of pulses. So, yeah, uh, but you can have the consumers talking up and emptying the shelves in the market, but you could still have that disruption in the supply chain. So you could have a bit of a slowdown in business for a couple of months and then the business coming back with a bang because you need to refill those uh, stores. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if the whole world is going to be quarantined and have to stay home, then this uh, is a good thing to have. You can store them and uh, they're easy to, to cook. Thanks, Francois. Um, without any further questions, we might wrap it up there because I have gone a little bit over time. I do apologize for that. If you are looking for any further information on pulses, GRDC Grow Notes are a very comprehensive resource. Also, the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project has a number of activities occurring during 2020 to bring you the latest pulse information. We have a network of discussion groups across Victoria and South Australia for existing and new pulse growers. If you have any other suggestions or requests for things that you'd like to learn about pulses, please let myself know via email is best. Claire at bcg.org.au and keep an eye out for future webinars occurring. Thank you, Francois Darkas, for a great presentation. Once you leave this webinar, you will be redirected to a screen with a quick survey link. It has five questions. It should take you no more than a minute just to see how you found today. If you're able to fill it out, 
that would be very much appreciated and will help us to continue to bring you Pulse webinars. This is a monthly initiative, so the next one will be later next week. If you would like to be kept in the loop of these webinars as they occur, again, please email myself and I'll add you to the distribution list. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you, Francois. Thank you.